Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In the last episode, I showed you how we could recreate this figure using tools from the tidyverse, especially ggplot2. My version looked like this, which is, if you'll have to say, very similar to what we had here. A little bit of differences here and there, but overall, I think we did a pretty good job of faithfully reproducing the original figure. This figure actually is figure one from a paper called Unveiling the Importance of Heterotrophy for Coral Symbiosis Under Heat Stress, published in the journal mBio by Stefan or Stephanie uh, Martinez. Sorry for the mispronunciation of your name. This is a paper I picked because I thought the figures in this paper looked kind of interesting. There were a lot of these types of box plots gathered together um, as multiple panels in an individual figure. And so of course what I did was this figure one, which had an A and a B component. When discussing my version, I compiled these together using a package called Patchwork. To use Patchwork, I created the top panel as a single plot and the bottom pa panel as a single plot, and then used Patchwork to add them together and to add some styling like the A and the B. Looking at the original figure again, I recall saying that it seemed a bit clunky to have the symbionts on top and then this micromole of oxygen per centimeter squared per hour on the bottom, when we basically have the same treatments um, on the top and in the bottom, okay? So a little bit of background on the experiment was that they took uh, 72 coral fragments and they counted uh, the number of symbionts per square centimeter, which is what we have here on the top. And then they exposed uh, those fragments either to a light phase or a dark phase, either at 25 degrees or 32 degrees. And so the light phase is photosynthesis. <laughs> the dark phase is respiration. And at the time, I said that I didn't think there was a way to make this into a faceted plot. I think what I was thinking was for this top panel to be a single facet and for the bottom to be a single facet. So after thinking about that a little bit more, I think I actually could make this into a faceted plot. But what I'm going to do is hopefully make the plot a little bit more clear. And what I'd like to do is highlight maybe some of the things that I find challenging about this plot in a way to kind of help um, improve it a little bit. And of course, every figure is subject to critique and reinterpretation, and every figure um, is designed in the context of the story that the authors are trying to tell. And so my take on the original story might be a little bit different from what the authors had originally. So a couple of easy critiques would be these um, tick marks on the y-axis being gray instead of black, just seems a little bit odd. Um, the treatment labels on the x-axis is again, a bit odd, uh, especially since this is temperature uh, and this is temperature, whether it's light or dark. Um, and I find it also odd that the y-axis label on B is a unit, right? Um, and so I would rather have the y-axis indicate if it's respiration or photosynthesis, right? And so what I'm thinking about is can we make a three panel faceted plot where the first panel is the density of symbionts, the second might be photosynthesis, and the third be respiration. And we would give each of those facets its own y-axis. Now you might be saying, how can we do that with facets? Why wouldn't we just make three plots and then throw them together with patchwork again? You certainly could do that. And we talked about how you would do that in the last episode. But what I wanna do is show you some really cool tricks with facet wrap that will allow us to make custom Y axes for each of our panels. Over here in our studio, I have some example code to simulate the data that was in the original paper. Again, this is not um, a completely faithful representation of their data. This code I presented in a newsletter that I published, I think around September 6th. Um, I'll put a link up above and maybe down below in the description where I talk about how I'd go about recreating the figure I made in the last episode. All right, so let's go ahead and get all this good stuff loaded. And again, we have coral physiology as our data frame. And this is how I kind of had envisioned their data being represented, where again, in the first column, the fragment being 72 different fragments, the temperature exposure, there's two temperatures, 25 and 32, the density, the photosynthesis, and the respiration, okay? So I think of these three columns then as being the three variables I want in each of those three different facets. And so what we'll have to do to um, plot it that way though, is get the column names in a single column and the column values in a single column. We can do that using a function I talked about in the last episode briefly, which was pivot longer. 
So again, we'll take coral physiology and I will pipe that to pivot longer. And what will pivot are the columns density, photosynthesis, and respiration. Um, and so we could do calls equals C density photosynthesis and then respiration. Okay, and so that then, sure enough, gets us a data frame with four columns, the fragment ID, the temperature, the name, and the value. The fragment ID, I don't really need, but it's helpful for pivoting it longer so that there's kind of a, a index value, if you will, to indicate uh, what ties the row together. Anyway, so that's cool. So let's go ahead then, and as we saw in the previous episode, we can make a box plot out of this by doing ggplot AES, we'll put the temperature, the y-axis, we'll put the value, and then we'll do geome box plot. Running that, um, it says we've got a continuous x aesthetic. Did you forget to group the data? No, I forgot to set temperature to be a character. So we'll do as.character on temperature. And so now we get two box plots. Now this is all of the data being aggregated together. I could do something like fill equals uh, name, and name is the value of our variable. And so now what we get is a single plot where we have 25 and 32 with our three different values. But that's not what I wanna do. Instead of doing the fill by name, what I wanna do is facet by name. Facet wrap, and we'll define facets to be uh, equal to tilde name. And so that's basically saying, break the data part into facets by the name column. And again, because I've, I've been a minute since I showed you what that looked like, I forgot to add the part where I had pivoted longer. So we'll go ahead and look at that. So we have the name, again, the name being the three different types of variables, right? So we'll facet by the name. And so we run that. So now we have three facets for our three different variables that we are measuring, right? And so we now want to go about seeing how we might modify this to make it look a bit more attractive. So the first thing I always like to do, because it's an easy win, it would be to do theme classic. I think it just kind of cleans up the plot a lot and makes it look really nice and simple. Next, what I want to do is to get our Y axes to be specific for each of the individual facets. I can do that in facet wrap by adding scales equals, and then in quotes, free underscore y. Um, free underscore y will give each of the three facets its own y axis. If I had done free x, they'd each get their x axis, but they have the same x axis. So I'm not gonna do free x, I'll do free y. So now we have each facet having its own y axis. And something that I'm thinking about is whether it might look better to have the three facets stacked on top of each other because they share the same x-axis. And so it's kind of weird to have three x-axes and three y-axes. Um, and wouldn't it perhaps make a little bit more sense to stack them on top of each other? Because I'm not really gonna be comparing necessarily density of photosynthesis to respiration. Um, maybe I would, I don't know. I guess that would go back to the original authors and asking them what they thought was most important to emphasize. But as we currently have it, we could say n row equals one, and that would give us one row. If we do two rows, we'll then get two rows and two columns, which that's definitely not what we want. Alternatively, we could do three rows. And the more I think about this, I think I like this actually a lot, because then we have a common X axis for all three of our plots. And I think I'm gonna run with that. So the next thing I wanna do is get those Y axis labels, because right now it says value, as if the y axis is the same for all three of those. And we know that's not true. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this facet label as my y axis. And no, I'm not gonna write the y axis up here. I'm actually gonna get it to be over here where you would expect a y axis label to go. And so we can do that by getting this label to be on the left side rather than the top. And so we'll do this in a couple steps, but that will be the first step. We'll do a strip dot position equals left for in, within facet wrap. We could also do right to get that on the right or the bottom to get it to be on the bottom, but I want it to be on the left. And so now you're saying, well, but that's inside the Y axis label. I want it on the outside of the Y axis label, right? So sure enough, we can fix that with theme and we'll do strip dot placement 
and we'll then say outside. And so now we have our Y axis label on the outside of our Y axis. And so hopefully you can see the makings of Y axis labels here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that value label and we'll do labs. And so if we do Y equals null, then we'll get rid of that. While we're here, we may as well go ahead and add in the X. And so for X, we'll say temperature. And then I wanna say like degrees C. And so that's nice, but we want like a real degree sign here, right? And so we talked about this in the last episode that we could insert either Unicode or um, HTML code into our labels, any of our text, and get it rendered using the element markdown function from ggtext. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'll do library ggtext. I really like the ggtext package. And here then, um, I'm gonna add axis.title.x to be element markdown. And then here, I'm gonna put in the HTML for degrees, which is going to be the ampersand deg semicolon. Oh, and I forgot a comma here after the outside. And so now I've got temperature with that degree sign, okay? The next thing I wanna do is go ahead and remove the borders around my strips, which are now my Y axes. And I can do that in here in theme as well. Where What I can do then would be to do strip.background uh, because the border is determined by the background, which is an element rect, right? And so I could do something like fill equals red, uh, border equals blue, uh, get the comma, and what is it not liking here? Oh, it's not border, it's color. <laughs> the border is determined by the color argument. And so now you see that we get these red facets with the blue border. That's not what I want. So what I want is color equals NA. And so that then gets rid of that uh, border color. I think I could also do element blank, and that gets you the same effect. Maybe I'll roll with the element blank because it's a little bit simpler uh, in terms of syntax. So now we have our y-axis label basically where we want it, but we don't have the right label, right? So now we wanna go about thinking about how we can fix that label. And so what we're gonna do is create a vector that we can use to map uh, density photosynthesis respiration to the correct label. And so let's start simple here by I'll say pretty uh, names, and it's gonna be a vector of my pretty names. So I'll do, I'll capitalize things, right? So I'll do density, photosynthesis, and respiration. And I gotta fix my comma here. All right, load that. And then I wanna give names to my pretty names. So this is a named vector. And so again, that will be, um, Names, pretty names, I'm gonna do C, uh, density, uh, photosynthesis, and then lowercase respiration. And so now we've got pretty names, which as I said, is a named vector. So I could do like pretty names, um, respiration, and I should get, well, if I put it in quotes, because it's a string, right? Um, I'm gonna get capitalized respiration. And so we can use this um, vector inside of our facet wrap uh, function call. And so here the argument we will use is labeler, and that argument will equal the labeler function. And what we give it then is the variable that we want to relabel equaling our vector. And so what we want to relabel are, is the name column. So the name equals pretty names, and if we run this, we now get capitalized variable names, which is cool. Now what I wanna do is go ahead and add in the units. So I'm gonna start out by putting the pretty names on separate rows, and my density, I recall, was um, actually symbionts per centimeter squared. So I'll go ahead and do symbionts, and then in parentheses, I'll do that, and so that'll be uh, soup, uh, for superscript, uh, and it's gonna be minus two actually, and then uh, forward slash soup uh, to get out of that. And so let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like for pretty names. And so of course our label is not 
been updated. And so we'll go ahead and do that with element markdown. So that's gonna be strip.text equals element markdown. And so now we see we've got symbionts per square centimeters. Cool, so now we wanna do the same thing for photosynthesis and respiration. Um, it's gonna be that micromole oxygen cm squared per hour. All right, so let's go ahead in here and we'll do photosynthesis and it's gonna be mu, which I saw before was at mu semicolon mole o subscript um, and that should be two. And then it's gonna be cm superscript minus two soup. And then it's gonna be per hour, right? So then it's gonna be soup minus one. Uh, actually, actually, I need to put an H in there, right? I think I heard someone, thank you. Uh, soup, cool. So, and then we need to close in parentheses to kind of lock in our, our unit. So let's go ahead and run that. And so now we get our label. We can see it's formatted, but it's way too long. And so what we'll do here is I'm gonna go ahead and put in the BR uh, anchor from HTML, which should put things over a line break. And so there we see uh, photosynthesis and micromole oxygen uh, centimeter squared per hour. Maybe we could put a space between each of those three units. So I'll put a space between before the centimeter and then before the hour. And I think that looks pretty attractive. So what we'll do is the same thing, uh, bringing that down for respiration. There we go, very cool, right? So now we have our three different variables, um, each with their own y-axis label, which is really the label for each of the three facets, moved to the left and then plotted on the outside of that y-axis. One thing I'm thinking about though, is that our y-axis um, doesn't go down to zero for all of these. And that was something that the original had that I actually kind of liked was that it included zero for the number of symbionts. And of course it included zero for this, this level of uh, micromole oxygen flux. Um, and so let's think about how we can do that. One of the challenges though, is that it's really difficult or impossible to customize these three axes separately. And so what I'm tempted to do would be something like scale y continuous. And then I would like to do something like y lim equals zero to na, right? But can you see what's gonna be the problem here? Yeah, the respiration, all those values are negative actually. And so that's gonna cause big problems, right? Because then I don't think those are gonna show up. Um, and so I think I put y lim and what I meant to put was limits and we'll do limits, there we go. And yeah, it tells us that it removed 69 rows that had nine finite values um, because those were all, um, you know, three of the 72 basically values were kept here because those respiration values were all negative. So I think what we'll do maybe instead of um, using these respiration values as negative is to make them all positive because respiration is the opposite of photosynthesis. It's like oxygen um, coming in rather than going out, if you will. And so this might be a, a scientific sleight of hand, but maybe what I'll do here around my respiration values is make these the absolute value. And so now when I do that, I do get zero for all my y-axis values. Again, that's a bit of a trick. We're basically flipping the sign on the respiration. And, and maybe what we could do if that worries you too much would be to say like, put a negative sign before that mu. Uh, and so that it's basically negative flux, right? It's, it's oxygen coming in rather than going out. I don't know. Um, but the, the challenge is customizing the range on the Y axis. And we might like to do something like add in specific breaks for each of the plots, but that doesn't really work because the same breaks are gonna be used for all of the plots, right? So if I do it by one unit increments, it's gonna do that for the symbionts as well. And that's gonna be eh, kind of weird, right? So we're kind of stuck with that, unfortunately. So the final thing I'd like to do, I think, is put in those bars indicating that these are significant. Of course, in the legend, I could say, all differences were statistically significant, but um, let's make it a little bit more obvious. One thing that we did in the last episode was annotate. And the problem with using annotate is that we give it an X and a Y, 
But here we have three X's and Y's. And it's difficult then to parse it apart across our three different um, variables, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new tibble that for each of the three variables will have the coordinates for um, where we wanna put things, right? And so here I'll call this sig table and we'll make that a tibble. And we're gonna have um, the name being the values of density, photosynthesis, respiration, and then we're gonna have X. And again, what we saw in the last episode is that this is one and this is two. So we'll do like 1.1 1 .1, um, for all of these and X end will be 1.1 for all of these, uh, or I guess 1.9, because it's gonna end right before the first, the next one. And so running that, um, forgot closing parentheses. Oh, right. And so these aren't uh, columns, these are strings, so I need to put these in quotes. And so let's go ahead and run this. And so now we see we have X, X end. We'll also like to have uh, y um, and y end. And so the y values, we're gonna have three y values, so the start position for that, um, that bar. And so for the top one, let's go ahead and do uh, 55, the photosynthesis, we're gonna have eight. And then for the third one, let's go ahead and make that four. Um, my y end is gonna be the same as y. Yeah, let's go ahead and start with that. And then we can add to this, to geom box plot, we can add geom segment. And here we will then do AES, and we have X equaling X, Y equals Y, um, X end equals X end, Y end equals Y end, and we need to give it the data. And so we'll then say data equals significance, what did I call it? Already forgotten, sig table, sig table. So let's go ahead and run that. So I'm getting this warning that it removed two rows containing non-finite outside the scale range. I'm not totally sure what that was. Um, I forget if that was there before. So I'm gonna comment out geom segment because that's something I just added. And yeah, it is complaining here that I removed two rows containing non-finite values. Um, wonder if those are negative values. Uh, let me go ahead and rerun everything to make sure that that gets updated. And you know what, maybe I'll go ahead and add that for photosynthesis also, um, abs. Uh, so that ran through without any errors. So this is a little bit of a hack adding that absolute value, but looking back at the original data, the photosynthesis values are, are pretty well above zero. And so I think it's mainly a problem that I have <laughs> and the respiration values are all below zero. Anyway, I'm not gonna worry about it too much. I think what I'm seeing with needing the absolute value on photosynthesis is really a, a product of how I did the simulation. So again, that's really not the point that we're trying to illustrate here. All right, so we'll go ahead and put back in that geom segment. That gets us the line. Now we wanna add the point, right? Uh, and so we'll, I'm gonna do a point table and we'll do tibble and I'm gonna grab all this stuff, I won't use it all. It'll give me a good start so I don't have to fumble my way through typos. And so X is going to be 1.5. And then Y, I'm gonna make a smidge higher than each of these. So maybe like 58, 10, five. And then um, label equals star. And so we'll do a point table. And then now after geom segment, I'll do geom point with data coming from point table. And again, we'll do AES, X equals X, Y equals Y, label equals label. Get our plus at the end here. Unknown aesthetics label. Um, oh, because I did geom point. I think what I want instead is geom text. That then gets us our star. Um, I think my star was way too high for photosynthesis and respiration. So I'm gonna bring that down a smidge. Um, coming back here, so 58 was fine, nine, uh, that I'm gonna make 4.5. So we could probably bring it down even more. Uh, I'm gonna put here, let's do like 8.5. And 
Actually, you know what? I'm going to make it maybe 5% greater than what I had here. Let's see if that works. So I'll do this 1.05, and that looks pretty good. That's a consistent separation between the line and the star. And so then in Geom Text, I'll go ahead and make the, the symbol a bit bigger. I'll do size equals, uh, let's do five, and then font face equals bold. So that made the font a little bit bigger, uh, but it's getting clipped off at the top there. And so maybe I will drop it down just a hair. So let's do 3% and that's still getting clipped. Let's go up 2% and then if that doesn't work, we'll try another trick. All right, so that's still getting clipped. By now, you should know um, how to deal with that clipping from previous episodes. We can do chord Cartesian, then I'll do clip equals off. And so now we get the full star. Okay, I think I said that was the last thing. There's one more last thing I wanna try, which is to go ahead and put in a x-axis line, right? Because sometimes people find having three panels like this just kind of floating out there uh, a little bit uh, unsettling. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a geom H line, my Y intercept, I'm gonna make zero. So that gives me a nice line separating the three plots pretty effectively, I'd say. Um, and I will then go ahead, and I think one last thing I'll do is remove this bottom tail that I have. And so we can deal with that using the expand argument. So we can do expand equals C zero comma zero. And that gives us a nice flush bottom there. And maybe one more thing that we'll do <laughs> is to separate our facets. We'll do panel dot spacing and that takes unit. Uh, so we'll do unit and then let's put in here like four just to see where that gets us up. Oh, and I need to give it the units to give it. So we'll say units equals PT. Um, and that's smaller than what it was before. So you can now see that the star is on that x-axis line, right? So four wasn't big enough. Let's try 10. That gets us some separation. Why don't we go ahead and do like 15? And that gets us some pretty good separation there. All right, so I'm pretty happy with the way this looks. One thing I'm noticing is that they had this times 10 to the fifth in the upper left corner. Um, I think I'm gonna put that in my symbionts label. So let's just polish that up here really quickly. And so I'll say times 10 soup, five down soup. And so that I think does a pretty good job of replacing that times 10 to the five up there. And I'll go ahead then and GG save to do um, facet box plot dot PNG. And I'll make my width equal to three, my height, equal five. Again, I'm pretty happy with the way this looks. Um, there's always little things that we could tweak and poke at um, to make the figure just that much better, but I'm pretty happy with this appearance. And again, a lot of this is a matter of personal preference, but ultimately what we should be asking ourselves is what's gonna make it easier for our audience to understand what's going on in our figure. Um, I like this, uh, the dark versus light that they had in the previous versions of the figure. I didn't really like because it wasn't clear what it was or how it was being measured. Also, before they had treatment on the x-axis rather than these are temperatures. And so I think that's a little bit more clear. Anyway, um, let me know what you think of this down below in the comments. Also, if you have ideas for figures that I should be thinking about making in future episodes of Code Club, um, you know, making the original and then making a new version based on some critique or just trying to explore some other part of ggplot, let me know. Put that down there in the comments and I'd be happy to follow up on that in a future newsletter and series of episodes. Please make sure that you subscribe to the newsletter so that you're getting my narrative of how I think through building plots before I go on here and make those plots. And so make sure you've subscribed to the channel as well so that you're updated when those videos drop. All right, well, hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.